Well, for more on the developments in Ukraine, I'm joined by Klaus Lares. He's a professor of history and international affairs at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Thank you much, so much, sir, for joining our program today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, let's begin with one of the biggest concerns in Ukraine right now, what we've been talking about, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, and real fears that any fighting there could turn the situation into a nuclear catastrophe. How much of a possibility is this, in your opinion? Well, certainly it's a very dangerous situation. Shelling a nuclear plant can't be recommended at all. Things can go wrong. But I understand that the main danger actually does not come from shelling because the plant is supposed to withstand the crash of an airplane, for example. So a few light shells will not matter all that much. But the cutting of, uh, um, of electricity to the plant, to the reactors of the plant, that could lead in the end to a meltdown of the reactors and a similar uh, catastrophe which we saw in Ukraine in 1986 when the Chernobyl nuclear reactor melted down. Yeah, we certainly don't want a repeat of Chernobyl. Putin says he would support IAEA monitors at the plant to assess the situation there if that goes ahead. How significant would that be and what would they be looking for? I think that Putin himself is worried that something may seriously go wrong with the nuclear plant because until recently he has suggested and insisted that these UN inspectors should really go from Russian occupied territory to the plant and the Ukrainians were opposed to that they said that should come from Ukrainian territory and Putin has given in he basically has not mentioned his insistence on you know where the inspectors should come from and that to me is, indicates that he is worried that progress needs to be made that the UN inspectors should tell the world that either the plant is safe and not damaged at all, or that some damage has occurred which urgently needs to be repaired and rectified. Well, let's talk about this other big development, these drone attacks reported in Crimea, far from the front line. Um, this is an attack attempt on the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet. What kind of impact um, do these attacks have on the Russian forces and their overall strategy in this conflict? Yeah, we have to consider that the territorial war at the moment has come to a standstill. Uh, the Russians are not making many territorial gains at the moment in eastern Ukraine, but the Ukrainians are hardly taking back any of the uh, conquered territory by the Russians. So the war has gone into other areas right now, at least, and we are also still waiting for that big offensive the Ukrainians have said would come in the Kherson area. So the Ukrainians are now focusing on Crimea, telling the Russians they are not safe even in that relatively far away uh, occupied province of Crimea, and that has unsettled the Russians. They have withdrawn their ships uh, to, the, uh, to the coast of Crimea, so not further to endanger them, because, you know, one of their big warships, the Moskva, was uh, damaged and then sank in uh, mid-April. They don't want to have a repetition of that. And that Ukrainian drones should get to the headquarters of the Russian army in Crimea, which is way down in the south of Crimea. This is most unsettling. It also is unsettling to the Russian people. There were many tourists on Crimea who are now fleeing the, the island or the peninsula, and they uh, are, will report what has happened in Crimea to them, to the rest of the Russian population. So that can spread uh, the knowledge and information about the war to the rest of Russia. And that is, of course, something Putin is not keen on having happen. Mm. Well, let's turn to attempts at peace here that have so far been in vain. Uh, there was a recent meeting, as you know, between Guterres, Zelensky and Erdogan uh, from Turkey. No major progress here. Uh, how significant do you see the role of Turkey and some of these other international players in this conflict? Do they have any leverage at all? Yeah, particularly Turkey and Erdogan has developed into a very important person regarding the war. He managed to get that grain deal of late July together, which is working. You know, it, uh, there's talks that it should be expanded. It's not working uh, sufficiently uh, well enough, but still, uh, it's much better than if there had been no grain deal and no ships were being able to leave Ukrainian ports. So that was a pretty good success for Erdogan. It really happened under his mediation, and now he's pushing for a settlement of the war, and he's also pushing for uh, safeguarding the nuclear plant, but above all he has said that a spirit of compromise should rule between Putin and Zelensky, and that perhaps ceasefire talks should take place pretty soon. And I think so far, as far as we can judge, 
Erdogan is the only one who can mediate such talks. Whether the Russians and the Ukrainians are ready, this is a totally different question. But there is a G20 summit in Bali in November. And Putin has said he will attend, President Xi of China will attend, President Biden will attend, the European Union will attend, and many other important politicians. That, of course, could be the occasion of settling the war, of signing a peace treaty, which in the next one or two months should be negotiated between delegates from Russia and Ukraine, perhaps uh, together with uh, Turkish mediators. Whether that will happen, I don't know, of course. We can all hope for the best.